Here we are in Psalms chapter 112, 112. We're going to read the first three verses. And also we want to look at a passage of Scripture in the Song of Solomon chapter 2. We'll read four verses there, one to four. Something in this passage here. I don't know, you know, when you're, when you're going through your devotions, and that, that's what I was doing, we're reading through the book of Psalms in, in our devotions, and uh, you know, the list that we have, we, that we give you at the front of the year, where we can read down through those and have something uh, every week and every day to read, and just a precious time to read through the Bible in the year, it's a wonderful deal. You know, as I was going through the Psalms, this, this just touched my heart, I know I've read it over and over many times, but... I just loved what this said. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. And this is what caught me. That delighteth greatly in his commandments. There's something about sugar that attacks us. We can't wait to get it in our mouth. It doesn't matter if it's a snicker or a strawberry milkshake or... A pecan pie, or and they they have all kinds of alternates trying to keep you off of it, but nothing tastes like the real thing. <clears throat> That's my take on it. But can you imagine it's your spiritual man, so hungry for God that instead of drinking a Dr Pepper like I can't wait to get it, something else comes up. I delighted greatly in. His commandments. I wanted to hear what God had to say so bad. Woo! So we need the spiritual sugar rush. Lord, take me back to being hungry for God. The Bible says they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to leave like that chameleon and be uh, getting spreading that spiritual disease on everybody? Or are they going to get in there and fight the good fight of faith? Yeah. They're going to do it. <clears throat> number, number two says, His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. blessed. And verse number three, I know you don't want none of this stuff, but this is a promise to those that, <clears throat> that greatly delight in his commandments. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. When I was asked to preach uh, Sister Barnes's funeral, which is really going to be a time of rejoicing for us because we know her life, that she lived for God so tenderly. Uh, Connie was telling me yesterday, she, uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that she, I love to hear that rain. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woo! Yeah. Thank you, Lord. One of the things that she always said was, if you want to be sweet, when you get old, you must tr practice while you're young. Amen. Amen. That is a statement from that dear sister, Maggie Barnes. And let me tell you, she was a sweetheart. When I saw her two weeks ago today, uh, she was, she was so happy. She was just uh, real slowly getting out of her room an hour and a half before they serve. Because I, I went there right after I got out of jail. And I, I went back there to her room and I said, could I, could I help you a little bit? And she said, okay. She said, I said, I guess you're going down to the cafeteria. Yes, sir. I'm just going to go down there and wait an hour and a half. We're going to go down there and wait till they get ready to feed us. I said, okay, baby, let's, let's go. So I pushed her down there, and uh, her little old body was about half of what it was when she went in. Uh, she just a little stooped baby, just, just a little old body, just wearing out. But I'll tell you what, we had such a sweet visit. It was just wonderful, and she was, she was just tender. And like, like I said, so sweet. And she loved the Word of God. That, that makes a difference, doesn't it? <clears throat> Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and the promise to those that love, love, love the word, the, the, the delights in it, that their righteousness endures forever. Here in uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, we'll, we'll just go to verse number 3. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse number 3. 
As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow, and notice this word. I sat, I sat down under his shadow with what? Great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Lord, we just love you so much. We thank you for the word, and we can't say it enough. Thank you for the rain today. And Lord, thank you for the spiritual rain that you're willing to pour out upon us. And Lord, all of us need to live under the, discip the discipleship and discipline of your word. Lord, help us to regard that greatly delight that you're guiding us every day. You're giving us strength. You're turning us, Lord. You're letting us live in the light of your love. And so let your power, Lord, register in our spirits afresh this morning. And everybody said, amen. 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 I just want to talk to you this morning about the thought and why about serving with great delight. The word delight means to give great joy. Or pleasure it means the power to please when you delight in something whatever that something is it has power to bring ple pleasure into your life and that's what this word does to us it takes the lost and makes them found it takes the sick and makes them well it takes the confounded and gives them understanding. And as you walk in the light of the gospel, man, y'all's y'all lesson was so full today of scriptural truth as, as many in, in the Sunday school class was being a part and, and given the scriptures that goes along with the victory that helps us overcome the problems in life. That's a, that is a good way. So serving with great delight is so important. Uh, when, when you think about the, the Song of Solomon that we just looked at, at here in Song of Solomon uh, 2 and 3, it says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, <clears throat> you could put an apple tree in the midst of thousands of mesquites or pine or whatever, and it would be easily noticed, especially whenever the fruit's on it. And so she's, she's talking about, I, I, I looked it over and I found it out there in the woods and I reached up and it was, it was something wonderful in my life. And this is a caption of the church, of the, of the joy between the church and Jesus, the victory of, of being able to tell him from anything else. There's nobody like you, Lord, in all the world. Nobody's like you, Lord, in all the world. That's, that's what the song says. And it's not just a song. It's the truth of, God, of the gospel. And so here it is in kind of a poetic scene, but it's speaking the same thing that anybody could tell an apple tree. It doesn't matter if it's in the forest and however many other trees is around it. It's very seeable. Friends, you get close to Jesus, there's nothing else like Christ in all the world. You can take all the denominations and all the churches. They are not Christ. They're supposed to be representing him. But when you meet Jesus, Woo, something really happens wonderful in your life. I remember right after I got saved that some of the guys I was working with there at the Crowfoot Feedlot in Lubbock said, you, you must have got religion. I said, no, you're not going to believe this. I lost my religion. But I just found Jesus as my Savior. I'm not the same man I used to be. I was a denominal caller. But now I'm born again, and woo, by the grace of God, what joy, what joy comes into our lives. I was looking at some of the people that showed this up in their hearts. And if you look at Ruth chapter 1, verse, we'll start reading in verse number 14. Her and Ophrah have both lost their husbands. And Naomi is fixing to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. And she tells these two girls, there's no way I can have another child in time for y'all to marry him. I'm, a, I'm an empty vessel. My husband's dead. Both of my sons are dead. Y'all go back to your people and back to your gods because I'm going back to Bethlehem. And Orpha, she lifted up her voice and wept and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth done something. She got a hold of her and she wouldn't turn her loose. She clave 
unto her. And these words are memorable. The, the next three verses we're going to read, you've heard them before. But you can see the delight in this girl's life that I'm going to stay with you. And she said, this is Naomi speaking to Ruth. Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Just go back and be what you was before. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. Whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. This is the delight of leaving sin and finding righteousness. And what Ruth portrayed here in the book of Ruth comes out so wonderful. The promise is it shall be well with the righteous. It's going to happen. And what Psalm said in Psalms 112 and 1, that scripture we just looked at, that the blessing is upon those that greatly delight in his commandments. And Ruth had got a hold of that. She knows about Moab and all the idolatry, but she saw in Naomi a God that's different than any God she's ever seen. And she, got, she said, I'm hooked to it. Okay. Look, look back to verse number 17 of that chapter. <laughs> Where thou diest, that's a pretty strong commitment. I will die. And there will I be buried, the Lord do to me, and more also if aught but death part thee and me. And look at verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go to church with her. <clears throat> Then she left off speaking unto her. I can't stop you. You're going to go anyway. Where is that spirit in today's world? I was asking Stephen. He loves motorcycles. I was asking him, did you ride that motorcycle in this morning? He said, no, it's too cold. But guess what? They got a vehicle. <laughs> They came in. So aren't you glad we didn't come today in a horse and buggy? <clears throat> Brother Nettleton, it'd be a long, it'd be a long ways in the wagon, wouldn't it? <laughs> From out, out there in y'all's country up, up to here, that'd be, that would be chilly. But the old timers, guess what? They love the Lord so much they made their mind up. It don't matter if it's raining or snowing or ice on the ground. They hook the team up. Climbed up in that wagon, and this is what my grandmother said pulled a quilt over us, and we started trotting in to the house of God. What's wrong with them? They love serving the Lord. That love needs to be reproduced in our life daily. A delight. A delight is not a have to, a delight is I want to. In fact, I can't wait to get there. It's exciting, an exciting thing. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, a scripture we use often because it's so precious, it depicts Christ, why he endured the cross, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, would you say it with me? Who for the joy. You mean going to the cross was joyful? No, that was not joyful. But knowing the outcome, what it was going to do. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy of knowing that what I'm doing is going to make a difference in the eternity of so many other people's lives. So here's the reason why that we serve him with great desire light. Number one, without Christ, we are open targets to Satan's weaponry. If you don't have Jesus, you are led by the devil. That's hard for us to say. We think that we're our own man, our own woman, and that we're just doing it because that's the way it is. But friends, really, if, if we're not led by Christ, we're led by what the devil brings into our life. There's no real in between. Without Christ, we're open targets to Satan's weaponry. You look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. It was just like everybody's living right here. According to the prince. prince. You know who that is? That's the devil. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so the spiritual walk 
is with the devil if you're not with Jesus. It happened in my life. It happens in yours. It's just the way that we go if Christ is not the Lord of our lives. So without Christ, we are open targets to Satan's weaponry. With him, we have a promise in Isaiah 54, 17 that really makes us look around and say, you know what? I could be invincible if Jesus is with me. Amen. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It doesn't matter if it's your telephone or your computer Help me? Or your laptop? No weapon. You think the Lord doesn't know everything? If you want Christ, friends, there's enough of Jesus out there to keep you off of the other stuff that could take you down. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So we have a place of invincibility if we love the word. If we're delighted in the word of God. I heard our general assistant superintendent tell a story that just broke my heart and still resounds in my life. Here is a, a pastor and his wife. They've caught him, the pastor, with porn on his computer. And so they have to come to his house. They put him out of the church they have to come to his house and tell him, you're no longer a licensed minister. His wife has no idea until they come. And, and he said the cry of his wife was so heartbreaking to know that not only had he destroyed his own ministry, but he had destroyed his wife's ministry as far as at that church. And she wasn't even a part of it. And he's begging, begging people, don't allow the devil to get between you and God. Why? If you delight in him, if you delight in the Lord, something happens. He's going to, he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Friends, the devil cannot take you down if you're full of the word of God and you rely on what God has got to say. Don't make your mate or somebody else be so brokenhearted that you walked away from Christ for something that has no eternal value. You could be an invincible person. As the apple of the tree, you can look at that apple and say, you know what? This apple I love is Jesus. <laughs> That's the fruit. I reached up there and got a hold of that. It was so wonderful that I didn't want the other stuff. Have you ever been so full you couldn't take another bite? <clears throat> Even your neck was full. You done ate two pieces of pie, so you're like... And they bring the ice cream out. I say, I can't get no boys. <laughs> if you stay that full of the word of God, guess what? The devil does not have a chance. It's the empty, hungry soul that's not fed with the gospel. The devil, he preys on those individuals and tries to take them out. Your invincibility is available if you listen to the Lord. But the sinner is vulnerable to every satanic entrapment. You may, you may not be caught by the first temptation, but he just keeps bringing different temptations around until you finally give in. It may be a curse word. It, it I mean, this, it may be a grudge. It may be a gripe. I mean, the devil's got all kinds of temptations to bring past our way. And just a few, we'll look at just a few in the Bible that did not have this protection of no weapon formed against you. Now, why are we talking about delighted to serve him or serving him with great delight? It's because without Christ, we're open targets to Satan's weaponry. Are you just ready to take a bullet anytime? You know what the Bible says about the shield of faith? It quenches every fiery dart of the wicked. You can be invincible, but if you don't have your shield of faith up, guess what happens? We'll look at just a few scriptural truths. What about the idolatry of Jezebel? Can you see no, I mean the weaponry, it took her down. What about the hate of Shimei? that cursed David whenever he was coming out. Wow. It, it, I mean, hate, look how easily we, we are tagged by those things. What about the greed of Ahab? He wants Naboth's vineyard at the cost of his own life. He doesn't realize that at the time, but 
the prophecy as he enters in to Naboth's vineyard. Guess what the Bible says? Your blood's going to run the same place that Naboth's blood ran. And the dogs are going to eat your wife. It won't be nothing left but the hands and the skull. That's in the Bible. What happened to them? Because they had nothing to cover for them. They were taken by the devil at his will. What about the adultery of Herod? He marries his own brother's wife. What about the shame of Pilate? He's washing his hands trying to get the blood of Jesus off of him. And how does that happen? Because the devil has all kinds of temptations to take us down. What about the lust of Amnon for Tamar, his own sister? And you read that, it's heartbreaking. What about the jealousy of Cain? He kills his own brother, Abel. What about the immorality of Lot with his own daughters? And you, I mean, the list goes on. You say, that couldn't happen to me, friends. Anybody that's not living for God is vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. And if he don't get you one way, he's coming another one. Sometimes it's just self-righteousness. That happens right in the church. People say, well, I've got, I've got mine fixed. Nobody's got it fixed until you get to heaven. So we want to do like they was talking about this morning. Live every day keeping that stuff off of us that makes us like a chameleon. We want to be like Jesus Christ. What about the inconsistency of Esau? He doesn't want the things of God, but he cries like a baby once he's rejected. And guess what? He's dipped off into eternity with these words from God. Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? Why? Because he would not bend to the love of Jesus Christ. And that could happen to anyone. How come? Because without Christ, we are open targets to Satan's weaponry. What about the confusion of Korah to come before, Paul, before Moses and Aaron and say, we're just as good as you are, Moses. Had God called Korah and Dathan? No. They called themselves. But they, here they are, and, and 250 of the princes they brought with them. I mean, the devil, he, he never, something that was said today in, in the Sunday school class was that, that this chameleon spirit can get off on you and your children and the people you get around. It's uh, <clears throat> contagious. It's contagious. Woo! And so if we live for God and we delight in him, this stuff has no place to get a hold of us. And that's the shouting ground. Every weapon formed against you will prosper if you don't have the power of God to dissolve that in your life. Another reason that we serve him with great delight is because the world offers nothing of eternal value. In verse number three of this passage, <clears throat> Song of Solomon 2 and 3, it says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight. It's like I am rejoicing to be a Christian. I'm so proud to be a part of the bride of Christ. I'm proud to be in the house of God. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of of the Lord. What was the delight? Because he had learned Christ. He had learned the joy, the victory of being around the things of God and understood that we are eternal beings. You don't have to be old to know that you need eternity. I lost a brother just under me at 23. You talk about a heartbreak. He died within a quarter of a mile of my house, right on 180. Beautiful wife, two beautiful baby boys, and he's gone forever. Wow. Do you have to be old to need Jesus? No. no. If you go to the graveyard, there's infants out there all the way up. There's all kinds of graves. And so we want to look our world over and say, you know what? The only one that offers anything that has eternal value is this Jesus and what he says in this book. And so that's why I am delighted to serve and delighted to love the commandments of God Almighty. Worldliness gives sensual Pleasure that's seasonal, it's attached to eternal destruction. That's all worldliness offers. 
in light, it's hell for eternity. And so the Lord calls us out of that into the righteousness of Christ. In Luke chapter 16, here's a story about a rich man in Lazarus. The rich man didn't need God, didn't have time for him. This is Luke chapter 16 and verse number 23 is when we'll start looking at it. Both of these men died. Lazarus was a Christian, but he was a poor man, a beggar. The rich man was a good man. As far as you can see here, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't show him any other way except he just wasn't a believer. And in hell... He lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. How come riches was so wonderful, but all of a sudden now they have no meaning? And, and that's, that's the way the devil baits the trap for us. Look on down in verse number 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. You think the devil's not having a heyday? This guy could have got right just like Lazarus did. But he was so rich and had so much money. He fared sumptuously every day. He don't need God. Is money that good? Does it have eternal value? Not unless you send it ahead of you to missions or tithing or whatever. That's the only way it's good in eternity. Look at verse number 25. But Abraham said, son, remember that in thy lifetime, thy, receivest thou good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou are tormented. Look at the switch. One moment he's rich, he's got everything that money can buy. The next moment he's in hell and he's there for all eternity. That was 2,000 years ago and guess where he is this morning? Wouldn't he love to feel one drop of rain? All he asked for was just a drop of water off the end of somebody's finger, the man called Lazarus, that was a beggar at his gate. Could I have just one drop of water? And we're, we're hearing it rain and going outside and looking and it's so wonderful. And man, the wheat's jumping up and down and clicking its heels together and saying, Whoa! Bring on the girlings. <laughs> wonderful. How come? Delighted to serve him. Yes, amen. And serving him with great delight. All the joys of life are reversed, beholding the end of the wicked. Read this with me one more time. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. He was poor. He was a beggar. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Do you see the switch? And it's so, so critical, man. And so... To serve the Lord is, is where we want to run to. Ruth willingly served. She was proud to be a part of that. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, would you say it with me? And the world passeth away. The things that we're holding on to that have no eternal value, guess what? They pass away. Then nothing, nothing can stop that. What, one of the hard things that, that us boys did uh, was selling dad stuff after he passed away. And I guess one of the last things that we sold uh, that, that kind of hurt my heart was a 4630 John Deere. And that was, that was a I don't know. He just enjoyed that old tractor so much, and uh, we'd all used it. And when was as anyway, that it, it, it was it worth anything? Just, just a piece of pig arm. By that time, the motor was pretty well shot. It was it was it had been well used, and they just drug it up on a trailer and hauled it off. No eternal value. The stuff that we get a hold of that's so important, is it worth missing heaven over? No. So why would we serve him with great delight? Because we recognize everything that's in this world is just on a shelf. And one of these days, it'll just be dipped off into eternity. Have no, no eternal value. <clears throat> in Psalm chapter 112 and verse number three, this is part of our text today. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. That's the person that greatly delights in the things of the Lord. And notice these next words. His righteousness endureth forever. 
The song that Brother Rosa sang is so real in life because the people that's lived for God all their life, they've turned others to the Lord. We, we talk about uh, peer pressure. Well, there is something that's called positive peer pressure. You can be that. Instead of having people go the wrong way, you could be the peer pressure that says, let's take a step to the right. Let's take a step to the righteousness of Christ. Let's do it that way and be delighted to get that done. <clears throat> My pop read, I've, I've told the story, but I, I, love, I love telling this because I was part of it. My, I went with my uh, aunt. All of these loved ones are past now, but my, they, they live pretty close to us. My Aunt Sybil and Uncle Bill, they had two girls, and uh, we was going to go down there. I think another one of my aunts, uh, Aunt Juanita, went, and we got some uh, bushel baskets. They used to have those wooden, little, little wooden bushel baskets years ago. And they said, we're going to go down uh, on the Von Roder Peach Farm. It was out 180 about, I don't know, almost to Hobbs, that little Hobbs gin out there. And we got down there, and just before we started off a hill, right there on the right was a big peach orchard. And my, my great-granddad, Pop Reed, went with us. I was about five, probably. And uh, I remember him getting out. Now, this is crazy that you remember this much stuff, but I, I remember him getting out and pulling his pocket knife out. And he looked at my aunts and us kids. There was a bunch of us all in one car. We was in a station wagon. How long has it been since you've rode in a station wagon? Y'all probably don't even know what a station wagon is, do you? I see Ben. What's that stuff? <laughs> yeah. We was in a station wagon, all of us kids in the back. Anyway, Pop Reed got out, and he, he was like 80, probably 80 years old, <clears throat> young. Somebody ought to be shouting. <laughs> I wish Chris was here. We'd aggravate him a little bit. <laughs> He pulled his pocket knife out and he looked at him and had a big smile come over his face. You know what he said? There's probably a hundred trees out there. He said, I'm going to eat a peach off of every tree. <laughs> he was about 6'5 and weighed about 250 pounds. Not a bit fleshy, just big stout man. And I mean, we didn't see him till we got all of the peaches picked. And when he come back, he was full of peach. I don't know if he got that one off of every tree, but he tried a bunch of them. That pocket and I boy would peel them, eat them. He was, he was enjoying it. Was he happy? Oh, man. Shouldn't we look at Christ like that? Lord, I want some of every scripture in here. Let me read through the Bible. Let me find the joy. Let me find the victory. Let me delight in the commandments of the Lord because here's the promise. If I live for God and I love his word, my righteousness will endure forever. Woo! That's better than hearing those words, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew ya. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Don't you want to hear that? Enter thou in, thou good and and what? Once a month, once a year. Oh, two times a year: Easter and uh, and Christmas. Can you imagine facing God with that kind of a testimony and wondering why He says, "I, I don't know you." I was just a sideline to you. You see, being Lord means that he's Lord of everything. If he's not Lord of everything, he's Lord of nothing. And so where are the peach eaters? Lord, I'm going to step out and eat one off of every tree. I want to know what's in every book of the Bible. I've read this Bible over and over and over. I mean, from start to finish, the whole one. Year after year, no brag. I'm just telling you, the joys that comes out of the Word of God is why I'm preaching you this message this morning. Yes. Woo! When I found that in Psalms 112 and there in the Song of Psalms, I said, Lord, let me live with the joy, the victory. Yes. Woo! So wonderful. So the thought of bringing life is, is a wonderful thing and the thought of it lasting forever. And thirdly, and I'll be closing with this, and I'll close before five. Yeah, it's 12.02. You're not even missing Dairy Queen. They closed the one on this road, so you're going to be all right. 
in Luke chapter, well, well we'll look back in, uh, back to chapter, chapter 2 of Song of Solomon, verse number 3. Look at the latter part of this verse. His fruit was sweet to my taste. When you eat something that's good, you just want, let me try one more of the. Other. <laughs> How many has ever got peaches from California that was green when they picked them? And they trucked them in here and they finally ripened. But when you taste of them, it's just like. It has, it has no sweet in it. It's just uh, mush. And then you get one that's, that's been ripened on the tree. Yeah. Our, our son-in-law uh, brought us, a I don't know, a box like that. And the, the peaches was about that many in the bottom of it. And they come from Colorado. I don't know what town. But let me tell you, when you bit into it, the juice went everywhere and the sweet went everywhere. <laughs> They were so good. Me and Connie had to hurry to eat them before they were so ripe to eat them before they ruined. But woo! Yeah. You can't have none. They're all gone. But <laughs> they were delicious. Now, think, think, think about this. Hey, man, we're glad to have you. <laughs> think about this now. It's a pleasure of choosing what's right. When you delight in the word of God, you choose what God says. That becomes a choice in your thinking. It's not your way no more. Lord, how can I do better? Everything about the chameleon lesson was making choices that keeps us from saying something that we really aren't. It's, it speaks of hypocrisy. And that, that tongue, Amber. <laughs> oh, baby. Those of you that weren't here, they said that that tongue was twice as long as his body. It made me think of what a preacher says. <laughs> there was a lady come and asked the pastor, said, I'd like to put my tongue on the altar because I've been... Do, I've been saying bad stuff and he said well that thing ain't near long enough <laughs> I knew that'd take a while to get there but woo wow they was talking about the chameleon you can't hear but he's always that was, that was a lot of tongue wasn't it baby girl <laughs> this morning in the class what are we going to do? If we're delighted to serve him and if we serve with great delight, his commandments have meaning to us. The pleasure of choosing what is right. Every day we live, we make choices. Every day. Our language, our thought pattern, everything we do is all about choices. Whether you read or don't read is a choice. Whether you pray or don't pray is a choice. Whether you're kind or mean is a choice. Whether you drive fast or slow. Yeah, how many's had a ticket late? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, all of that is, is choices. You can run. You can run seventy if you want to. And I know seventy nine is better. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> if I stay, I heard one person. Say, if I stay under eighty, they usually don't stop me. <laughs> so life is a. Life is a choice. And the choice of the writer in, in, uh, in Psalms 112 is, I greatly delight in the commandments of the Lord. And that gives me opportunity to choose what is right. And look at this verse. His fruit was what? Sweet to my taste. You start taking in the word of God and living by the Bible, the whole life changes and it changes for the good. I mean, you take a bite of the word of God and your, your countenance just goes like a big old smile. Wouldn't it be neat to smile every once in a while? Yeah. How long would you like that? <laughs> just a little of that's enough, isn't it? What about them big old smiles? Say, woo! I love it so much, the difference it makes in my life. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse number 42. 
In this passage, Mary is all stirred up about cooking for the Sunday evening service. She don't have time to go to the altar. We're going to have early service at 5, dinner on the ground at 6. They hope, if the preacher's not too long. <laughs> yeah, you better look out now. <laughs> and here's Mary. Mary and Martha are sisters. I think they're kind of like brothers. The Lord said brothers are made for adversity. So she's in there sweeping everything up and cleaning up the kitchen and trying to get everything cooked. And she runs in there and she looks at Jesus. Master, don't you care that I'm doing this by myself? Make her get up and come help me. And Jesus, I mean, he puts a word in here that's so incredible. But one thing, he says, Martha, Martha, thou art covered about many things. But look here. But one thing is needful. And Mary has. Here is the key to serving him with great delight. It's a choice. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. And if I'm living, I will do it by the grace of God. Now, you can make a choice to be horrible. Or you can make a choice to be good. But look at this. Mary has chosen that good part and notice these words it won't be taken away from her so I beg you hang on to the things of God choose what's right don't bow to anything else and watch God bring a blessing that you won't be able to contain your barrel will be running over pretty quick if you seek him first the rest of the stuff will come into your life like it should in Psalms 119 and verse number 111 that's three ones in a row. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Nellie. She's being so kind to get the scriptures up for us. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. I took your word, Lord. This is, this is my heritage. What this book says, that's what I'm hooked to forever. For they are the what? They are the rejoicing of my heart. Woo! You talk about making you happy. The word delight means to give great joy, pleasure, or power to please. You find yourself in the Bible and do what the Bible says. That's one of the most pleasing instances in your life or mine. Is I found what brings great delight. His fruit, sweet to my taste. Then did I eat it. That's what Ezekiel says. I'm eating the word. I'm eating the, I'm eating the scroll. The Lord give me this Ezekiel 3.3. 3. I ate the roll. Then did I eat it? And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. My brother Terry gave me a, a quart. Me and Connie give us a quart of uh, honey the other day. There's an old house down below my, my dad's place where the migrant work, workers used to stay from old Mexico when they was pulling our cotton. That was before we had strippers. <clears throat> Cotton strippers. Let me get that. Let me get that out in the open. <clears throat> cotton strippers. They pull the cotton off the stalk. Yeah. yeah. But these boys by hand, there'll be about twenty of those men that stayed there. And now we have cotton strippers and cotton balers and all kinds of stuff. It's a wild world out there in the cotton world. But now, because that building's closed up, guess what? The bees have moved in. And he got a bee collector to go down there and take some honey out. And so he brought me a quart of that honey with some honeycomb in it. And I got me a big old spoon, one of those, not the small one, but the big one. A tablespoon. And I got some of that on there and I rolled it up real fast. And I said, and I said mm, mm, that's honey from our own house. <laughs> Right off our own place. Woo! They said, that's the, best, that's the best for you. The honey from your own, close to your house. Well, can you say amen? amen? They wrote a song, there's honey in the rock. My brother, there's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock. There's some honey in this rock right here. You can dig it out. I mean, I've watched y'all doing your Sunday school lessons and stuff. And I mean, it's just so precious for me to see you digging down and finding some, I found honey. It's not just dull. It's not just black words on white pages. But all of a sudden, 
the joy of the Lord comes out of you found something that's so meaningful in your own life. So why do we serve with great delight? Because without him, we're targets of the weaponry of Satan. Without him, the world offers nothing of eternal value. And with him, we have the pleasure of choosing what's right. I don't know if you've ever watched the honey badger. How many has ever seen a honey badger in action? Did you know he gets stung thousands of times? But what does he do? The whole time they're stinging him, he's digging in there. <laughs> and yes, our flesh screams when we're digging through the scripture. Our flesh says, I'm so tired. In fact, I'm sleepy. In fact, I don't understand the these and the thous. Who cares? Tell the devil, you don't have to understand everything. Just let me have some of it. Yeah. Connie was telling me how honey's made, and I got to thinking, I don't want to know how it's made. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me some honey. Come on now. <laughs> she said, ah! <laughs> You may not know yourself. <laughs> you're going you to look, and I've been eating. <laughs> well, there's some honey in the rock. Yeah! It come through lots of different people, but the Holy Ghost had the cover over the whole thing. And from Genesis to Revelations, it's honey for the human that brings life to us. And so the delight is awesome. That honey badger, the, the bees are stinging him like crazy and he just can't wait to get the next bite. He, <laughs> them boogers look wild, don't they? I ate it. It was good like honey for sweetness. That's the writer here. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. In Acts chapter 8 verse number 39, the eunuch that was saved and baptized, he heads back and the Bible says there's something happened. He, he leaves, he went on his way. Doing what? Rejoicing. Woo! That's the way we want to end each time of our walk with Christ, each day that with rejoicing, Lord, we're going forward. In verse number two of Psalms 112, and I'm closing with this, it's going to affect your family. If you greatly delight in the word of God and his commandments, it's going to affect your family. His seed shall be wimpy is that what it says <clears throat> his seed shall be mighty upon the earth the generation of the upright shall be blessed that's a promise from God so serving him with great delight is one of the best go signals for us in this life not like I have to do it but I can't wait to do it because I love him I love him so much I want to follow him would you stay with me this morning Lord we do thank you for your word and we ask as we get ready to come to these altars that you would touch our hearts fresh <clears throat> there's probably nobody that doesn't have some downtime but what happens if you allow it to stay around it starts turning you away from the delight of the Lord back to some fleshly thing and I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning if you know in your heart that the delight of serving God has been weak. And you want to re-up your walk this morning and say, Lord, as I lift my hand, I'm asking you that what I do to serve God would be great delight in my heart. I don't want it to be any other way. And we're going to have prayer this morning and believe God. I see hands going up right here already. Thank you. Yes, hands. God bless you. We're going to be praying. God, let what we do for you be from the thought of doing it with great delight. We bow in your presence. We thank you, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, if there's those here that doesn't know you in the free pardon of sin, that this morning they would come recognizing that what you promise us us has eternal value speak today into our lives Lord with brand newness that there be refreshing in our hearts Lord and your strength and your guidance in our lives Lord and let what we do be done with great delight to follow you we praise you for that now in the name of Jesus amen and amen come on and let the Lord touch
touch you this morning as you come to these altars. Mm -hmm.